Welcome to New York Bio's Virtual Breakfast Series, a digital program started in 2020 featuring fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. This week's episode brings us an investor, founder, and great ambassador for the New York City bioscience ecosystem, Carlo Rizzuto, partner at First Ventures. I have 901. Good morning, everybody. My name is Jennifer Hawksbland, and I'm the CEO of New York Bio. Uh, we're thrilled to bring you another um, installment of our virtual breakfast series. Thank you, especially to our sponsors and our partners on the Emerging Biotech Company Showcase, the New York Stock Exchange. Um, we look forward to um, virtually hosting an event with the, um, with the New York Stock Exchange on June 23rd, looking at European emerging biotech companies. Um, but before that, we're going to talk about New York investing in New York companies with Carlo Rizzuto. We're thrilled you're here with us today. Um, as always, please put your questions in the chat or the Q&A box and Derek and I will get to those as we can throughout our discussion with Carlo today. Uh, without any further ado, I'll turn it over to Derek to introduce Carlo. All right, Carlo, good morning. It's great to have you here. We've talked uh, a number of times on this program about you know, basically the resurgence of New York City and really kind of the wave of momentum around new venture creation, around really the entire ecosystem. And we're thrilled to have you because quite honestly, I think uh, you in person coming here and putting down roots were a really, really big step and a huge turning point in making that happen. So uh, really super excited to have you here. Thank you so much. Um, we usually kick off with a bit of an origin story from our guests. So why don't we uh, why don't we rewind the clock and talk a little bit about kind of how you got to where you are? Sure. Well, well, thanks guys for for having me. I really appreciate it. And uh, I guess I'm a long time listener, first time caller, as they say. <laughs> um, so it's it's great to be uh, to here with you today. Um, origin story. So. I don't know. I'm not sure where you want me to start. <laughs> so wherever you want. What, what, you can you can start where you want. I've got something teed up, but you can start where you want. Sure. Well, I mean, I guess I mean I'll start at the beginning. I was born on Long Island, and so I've always had a affinity for New York, and always wanted to live in New York and work here. But uh, going into biotech, I never thought I really could do that. Um, so it's great to be actually here and in, in, in trying to you know work within the ecosystem as well as outside of it and compare and contrast across. Um, so, I, you know, I grew up on Long Island, you know, I studied biology in college, I did a PhD in virology uh, up in Boston and Harvard, and then uh, actually started a biotech company with Flagship Ventures. It was their first ever biotech. Um, ultimately, uh, didn't quite work out, but it was a great learning experience. I went to McKinsey to try and learn some business, uh, you know, being a pure scientist at that point. And, um, and that, was, that was interesting. I got to move to Europe with McKinsey. Joined Novartis um, as chief of staff for Joe Jimenez, and then um, uh, went into uh, clinical development after that, and ran a few global program teams, which are the cross-functional teams that advance products through the clinic. Uh, and then I uh, was recruited to Versant, still in Switzerland, uh, where I was with Novartis in uh, 2012, and then um, convinced uh, my partners that uh, it was worth opening an office on the East Coast and rather than go to Boston with everybody else, we decided to uh, take a plunge and try and do something here. Um, and, you know, my, my job today is uh, starting biotech companies and investing in biotech companies. Um, some of that's here in New York and some of it's up and down the East Coast and a little bit of West Coast. And so I get, I get to uh, play in a lot of different ponds. All right, fantastic. So let's, so let's rewind to, uh, to Novartis. So you're the chief of staff, Joe Jimenez. And you know, can you tell us a little bit about what, so what does the chief of staff to the CEO of Novartis do, per se? Because I've, I've known actually a couple of people that have had that position and it seems like you do kind of everything, but you, can you talk a little bit about kind of the exposure you get under that kind of position and really what kind of stuff ends up filling up your day? Yeah, I, I, always, I always joked that my real title was GIMP. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, in, in a nutshell, I think the role is different depending on who's your boss and depending on you, it's kind of really what you make of it. Mm -hmm. In my case, um, you know, I was lucky in that Joe is not a, he doesn't come from a scientific background. He, he comes out of consumer goods into pharma. And so, you know, where I could really help him was in talking him through the kinds of BD deals 
that Versant was doing, uh, Versant, Novartis was doing, right? And, you know, how these companies fit with what Novartis was, was doing, um, talking them through the, you know, what were some of the issues that were coming up in the, in the pipe, pipeline and the portfolio. Um, and so that's where I could really add value to him beyond the usual stuff, if you will. The usual stuff be, meaning uh, making PowerPoint presentations and speeches and that kind of stuff. And, you know, just traveling around with him and helping him get stuff done is, yeah. is more or less the day to day. The, the, the one other piece that I really enjoyed of the job is you're sort of a bit of a ambassador to the company because, yeah. you know, he's only one person and he just can't. There's only, only so many people he can meet with in a day. And so you sort of extend his reach in a little bit uh, in, a, in, in a way. Uh, and that was a lot of fun as well. Yeah. So you went to a uh, late stage clinical development after that, which is not really, uh, that's not really the typical path after a position like that, right? No, the most typical path is people going down the commercial route. Yeah. So uh, oftentimes you'll see people kind of jump back to take a, a frontline sales role to get that firsthand experience, or sometimes they'll jump into country management. Uh, so, you, you know, you're in a, in a smaller market, um, but that wasn't really interesting to me. And, and so I, I took a little bit of an atypical path into development. Yeah. And I imagine that's probably served you pretty well in what you think about now. It was an amazing learning experience. You know, I didn't know anything really about drug development in truth at that point. And, you know, through that job, I got to go to the FDA two or three times and in front of the EMA several times and, you know, really learn what, what are the forces at work in, in, in development and how all of these really specialized functions like TOX and uh, DMPK and all, all of these things come together to create a product, an advanced product. Yeah. So how did you go from Novartis to Versa? So it was a, um, my, one of my predecessors, uh, a woman named Claire Ozawa, who's now a managing director at Versa, she, she had play the same role for Dan Vesela. Um, and when Vesela transitioned to Joe, she worked with Joe briefly um, before ultimately joining Versant herself. And, and then, so it was very natural that she recruited me uh, into Versant, given that we had really similar backgrounds. She's also a PhD, also at McKinsey. Mm -hmm. So talk a little bit about the, the conversations at Versant about, about coming to the States and, and ultimately coming to New York. So what kind of case did you have to make to, uh, to get an office open here? Was it, was, it, was it more the fact of, you know, hey, New York has all of these great assets or was it almost kind of a counterplay to there's, you know, there's 50 other people in Boston and we're gonna be, you know, eighth in line for every one of those deals? Yeah, you know, Versant's a pretty unusual firm in that we, we've kind of, pursued an unconventional strategy. Um, we are San Francisco based, and so that, that part's conventional, uh, but we've expanded very significantly in a geographic sense uh, from that base in that we have a lot of activity in Canada. Mm -hmm. um, you know, we are, we're probably the most active uh, or one of the most active early stage venture groups in Europe. And so we've gone off the beaten path to a large extent. Uh, as a U.S.-based venture capital firm, and so to some extent, when we when we started talking about opening an East Coast office, which we had none, uh, you know, we in in some ways New York was a was a natural uh, fit with our strategy because it wasn't the conventional place to go. Um, you know, I think the the partnership was willing to take the risk uh, because New York was an outstanding academic center and an outstanding financial center, um, and that you know we. We, we thought that there would be plenty of talent uh, through all of the New Jersey-based, you know, pharma ecosystem. And so there were a lot of things that lined up in New York's favor. And, you know, we can talk about how well those have played out or not. Um, hey, but, we'll get there. Uh, we'll get there. Um, so so it, it, in, in some ways, it was a relatively easy case to make in that it was a fit with our not unconventional strategy. And yet a lot of the fundamentals seemed to be there. Yeah. Now, did you did you move straight back from Switzerland to open the office here, or did you go to the West Coast first and then Versant open the office? No, straight here. Okay. Yeah. So, yeah. so I, I'd spent about, I guess, uh, two and a half, three years uh, doing venture capital in Europe, and then uh, and then came to New York. Got okay. it. Okay. That makes sense. So in for in the in the prep for day one, right, what kind of things do you do in terms of really kind of talking to stakeholders here 
right? So we're we're who was who was kind of instrumental in in helping kind of set things up, getting things settled, or did you really kind of just you know landed landed JFK, hail a taxi into Midtown and uh, kind of look <laughs> around and say what should I do now? Yeah, I mean mostly what I did in the kind of pre the pre work, if you will, is I spent a lot of time with the universities. And really try to, you know, get to know the, the tech transfer groups, get to know a lot of the PIs, and really understand, you know, kind of what were we talking about in terms of, you know, the magnitude of opportunities to create companies. That was probably the most, you know, biggest piece of work that I did. Um, Mark Tesla Levine in particular, uh, who was the president of Rockefeller at the time, was really helpful. As, as you'll know, Derek, you know, he, he was super active in trying to catalyze uh, the local ecosystem. <clears throat> and I think he saw, you know, us as a potential new entrant as another catalyst. Um, you know, I think it was, a, it was unfortunately a loss that he went to Stanford, but, uh, but he was, you know, he had a big impact certainly on us and I think on the ecosystem overall. He did. He had a, he had a big impact in a lot of ways. I think he was probably <clears throat> instrumental in having the, uh, the Arch folks come here too. Um, and in general, I think he probably played a really big role in kind of making capital pay attention to New York City. Um, and you, as you said before, you talk about being an ambassador. He was an exceptional ambassador for for the city and everything. And I, it's funny. I remember I remember talking to him after he after he got the position at uh, at Stanford. And you know, the the way it was described is basically that's a once in a lifetime opportunity that's really never guaranteed to come up. So you know. It's unfortunate that we lost him, although understandable that he went. You know, it would be it would still be great to have him here, but I think you look around and we still have great people around the table, and you know, you really can't can't kind of fault him for that. So yeah, in the no, I totally in agree. I mean, his his legacy is still felt, and you know, I think he's a he's a big part of why you know the ecosystem is is where it is today. Yeah, you know, he made a he made a big impact. So when you first get here, was there ever was there ever any moments of of kind of like you know. What, what have I done here? <laughs> did, did you have any of that or was it reasonably, was, was it pretty good in the beginning? Did you ramp up pretty quickly or did you ever kind of look around and say, okay, I'm going to have to, uh, gonna have to make something that is here? You know, it, I, I would say, you know, it was, it was definitely a mixed picture um, in that, you know, we, <clears throat> the quality of the academic science was absolutely very high. I would say it was focused a little bit differently um, than what you would see in Boston or the Bay Area. And, you know, we could talk more about that. Yeah, how, how so? Um, you know, I think, you know, those two, Boston and the Bay Area, these, you know, these days, if you're a biologist working at Harvard or MIT or UCSF, like you're con most of these folks are constantly thinking about how can I translate what I'm doing into a biotech and into the clinic? Right. And that's not necessarily the case. It hasn't been the case in New York. I think it was a more of a traditional academic ecosystem where you did good work, you published, yep. and that, that, yep. that, that was kind of the drill. Right. Right? And what you weren't necessarily thinking about, oh, you know, if I go in this direction rather than this direction, there could be a biotech at the, at the end of that. So that, they, that. They didn't have that entrepreneurial sort of just process of thinking about the research. That's right. That's right. I mean, some did, of course, and, yeah. and there's obviously some great transplants from Boston that have come down here, like Luke Cantley and Tom Maniatis and, and several others. Mm -hmm. um, but by and large, I think it was still a more traditional and academic yeah. environment. Um, <clears throat> and then so, so that was, you know, but that, that, that was fine. There were still plenty of opportunities that we could act on. Um, I think what we realized is that there were a few, you know, barriers, which maybe we underestimated. Uh, in terms of getting companies off the ground. And, you know, initially there were sort of there were real estate related challenges. I think those have largely been addressed, which is fantastic and mm -hmm. yeah. really pioneered by Alexandria. Um, uh, you know, they've just done a phenomenal job of building up the ecosystem. And now there, you know, there's multiple other groups as well. Um, but, you know, the biggest challenge and, you know, we could spend the whole hour just on this topic. You know, I think really it is trying to find uh, the right talent at all levels of a company okay. uh, to really enable you to build a fully integrated R&D based company uh, in New York. And I emphasize R&D because you know, there are a lot of many different models of biotech, right. but if you're looking to build sort of a research driven biotech company, um, that's more challenging 
uh, in New York than it is in Boston or, or there or San Diego or some of the other places. So how do you go about finding uh, people for that? And you could talk about how you did it, uh, did it early because you obviously had some you know, really solid uh, R&D people at some of the companies that you founded. But, you know, how would how did you go about it early? And, you know, if you had to think about things now, how do you think about it now? Yeah. And so can you guys do you hear a lot of background just to check because they're now like doing the facade on the building. OK, nope, sounds yeah, great. my landscapers are here, too. So, so. <laughs> <laughs> you blame it on me. I'll blame it on you. <laughs> let, let me let me just step back and talk about you know, the tap. What kind of talent is needed? Mm -hmm. At biotech. So I always think about three layers, right? You have um, the C-level team, which is, you know, everybody tends to focus there. You have the folks who are working on the bench, and then you have this middle management layer, um, which are really the ones who are kind of hands-on directing, you know, what's going on in the labs. Um, and really, they're, they're just absolutely critical, critical roles. Um, and what I would say is if, you know, and in, in obviously in Boston and in, in the Bay Area and other places, you have plenty of folks yeah. fall into all three of those buckets. Right. Yeah. And I think that, you know, what's been challenging in New York, and I think continues to constrain the growth of New York biotech, is that while we have, I mean, literally tons of super high quality grad students, postdocs, techs, who can work on the bench. And in fact, I would argue that you can probably access better talent and keep that talent at that level more engaged here than you can in Boston because in Boston, they're getting poached constantly to the next company. Right. Um, so, so that level in New York is great. And you can ask, you know, ask Nancy Thornberry about how, you know, she's been able to recruit a phenomenal team of bench scientists right there. The C level, right, is also pretty good, I would say, in the New York ecosystem in that you, you, know, you have a lot of senior folks who grew up through pharma, um, who, who want to stay in the area, and yeah. also a lot of people who've done well elsewhere and always wanted to be in New York, right? And so you can access, I would say, overall pretty good sea level talent in New York. Where New York really struggles, I think, is in the middle tier, where you need people who have real drug development expertise, but who can also afford to live in the New York area and raise their kids in the New York area, right? And that, that's the hard part to solve for, in my view, in, in this ecosystem. Yeah. And I imagine trying to get them out of, say, either a, a Regeneron or a Pfizer or a BMS or something, they're probably in, you know, mid-career ro roles where they have kind of growth ahead of them at any of those larger companies. Right. So that probably makes it a little bit challenging to say poach them from somewhere else. Yeah. And, and honestly, you know, for most of the big pharmas, and this was also, you know, maybe it was ob it's obvious in retrospect, but they've largely relocated, you know, their research talent to Boston. Right. So in New Jersey, you have late stage clinical, regulatory, commercial, but you don't really have discovery and early development. Right. And so that kind of there's a, there's a kind of a vacuum there that's been transplanted to Boston or in some cases in Philly. Um, and some of those folks are still here and commuting. And I think that's an opportunity. And, you know, we can talk about is there, is there a way to access those folks? Mm -hmm. I think that's a real opportunity for the ecosystem. But um, Regeneron is really, I think, the only sizable, you know, research and early development organization in the in the area yeah yeah they're a big one and you know honestly they're they they have very very strong science they're kind of an obvious candidate to look to for for folks that have that kind of experience so they've they've built that kind of science-based culture and they've they've kind of kept everything in one site and under one roof so you know again that's they're the they're the they're the softball question of where should i look for that mid-level talent yeah exactly yeah. So when you got here, we should also talk a little bit about really, I would say that the structure of the things that you're trying to do, because there's, you know, Versant has, you know, the, the typical, you know, venture model, uh, if you are in terms of both company creation, later stage financing, et cetera. But you also, you also started the, the Highline Therapeutics Incubator. And, you know, I think for a while, people kind of had them as synonymous, but, you know, they, they kind of do two different things. 
Yeah, that, that, that's right. So maybe I can just explain a little bit of, of what, you know, what is Highline and how does Versant operate, you know, here. Yeah. Um, you know, so, so the first thing to say is, you know, I'm a partner with Versant and then I'm also the head of Highline Therapeutics. Okay. Um, and Versant, we start companies in, in one of two ways. And I should step back and say, you know, as Versant, we start companies and invest in those companies and we invest in existing companies. So we do both. It's not like flagship or third rock where kind of everything right. is built in house. For us, I would say 60 Sixty percent of our companies are built from scratch by us with academic partners, and then forty percent, thirty or forty percent, or more traditional investments in existing companies. So that's kind of the rough um, breakdown of the companies we build. We do them in one of two ways. One is at what we what we would call de novo, which is one of the Versant partners just says, you know, you know I'm going to do this one, and we kind of roll up our sleeves and do it. Mm -hmm. uh, and then secondly is through our, we have various types of incubators around the world uh, that help us do that. Some of those incubators are wet lab based. Uh, so we have a big one in San Diego. We have a big one in Basel. They employ collectively 60, 65 wet lab based scientists. And so they're really there like on the bench yeah. doing, doing stuff. And then we have a few virtual incubators and Highline's one of those. Okay. And the purpose of, of Highline was really two, it was twofold. Um, one is we, um, we are able to hire like entrepreneurs and residents and folks into that entity uh, and work with them through, in that way uh, to help us start companies. And so it gives us leverage in a sense in, in, in being able to start companies. And the second thing is we can be more creative um, with how we partner with others. So for example, with Highline, we were able to strike a partnership with a pharma company who prefers not to be named, right? Who was interested in, you know, <laughs> yeah. they were interested in supporting the local ecosystem. And so they gave us some, some funding to help uh, fund research that could be translated into companies and help us hire folks to, to start companies in the ecosystem. So we were able to work in sort of more flexible ways through Highline than we can as a, as a you know, an LP uh, invested fund, uh, which is what person is. Right. So they're, so you're not, so you're basically advancing the concept, you're de-risking it, but you're not putting a whole team around it to, to build a separate entity or are you doing that through Highline? So as I said, we can do companies Either way, like we can do companies without Highline in, in New York, and we're actually going to announce one on Thursday uh, that we've done uh, independently. Sure, you don't want to announce it now? <laughs> I wish I could, but I, I would have a bunch of embargoed journalists very angry. At me. <laughs> but look for, there'll, there'll be an announcement on Thursday for our latest New York company. We're super excited about it. Uh, and that's a company we did independently of Highline. Okay. Um, but equally, it, it, it just it's just kind of horses for courses if it makes more sense to hire an eir into the highline structure and do it that way we can in the case of this new code which is coming out on thursday basically i was the eir um, in a sense from the verse inside working with the team that was coming together around the company yeah um we actually have a question that i think makes sense to ask here from the audience it says what is versus in quotes target annual number of new portfolio, New York City portfolio companies? And has Versant been able to meet, exceed this target? Yeah, so um, the short answer is we have no target. Um, it's really about selecting the best possible opportunities. And we do that in a geogra geography agnostic manner, right? So every single deal that we do goes through globally, goes through one committee, and that committee decides globally, you know, what deals we'll do. And they absolutely compete on equal footing, independent of geography, whether it's a Boston company or a New York company or a Basel company, right? <clears throat> so there's no target. Um, it's really as opportunities arise. Um, you know, I would say that, you know, if, if I'm honest, you know, and it's not just about Versa, I think overall, I think the picture in New York is glass half full, glass half empty um, in that, there have been some great companies started here. We've seen some great exits here. It's super exciting. The growth rate has been slower than I would like it to be. And I'm not happy about the growth rate that I see locally. I want it to be higher. 
but I think we're talent constrained, uh, as I mentioned. Um, yeah. Carlo, wait, let me, um, how many on average, because I know there's no exact answer, how many on average does your committee consider um, in a year for Versant? How many deals? Depends what you mean by consider. Um, you know, I would say collectively, the partnership probably looks at something like, uh, wow, a thousand opportunities a year, and we probably do 10 deals a year. Yeah. So that gives you a sense of the funnel. Yeah. And if we think about the way that, that capital is being deployed really kind of over the last five years, I think it's just accelerated a lot. You have much larger chunks of capital getting deployed and much, much larger deals. So, you know, how have things changed in terms of deal consideration and, and, and how fast things move? Because you have, you know, I mean, a great example is, is Graphite Bio, right? The Series A, uh, literally, you know, less, less than a year ago. And, you know, now you've got a, a $150 million crossover uh, in March, which, you know, it basically implies that there's a public listing in the next, you know, six to 12 months somewhere. So, you know, how does how do those deals basically even get considered now? I mean, the the, the amounts of money are so high, and the the timing. I mean, there's no there's almost no time in between rounds. Like, what is the process like for those things? Yeah, um, you know, it's a good question. And graphite's a little bit of an outlier. Um, you know, in in the, both the speed and the speed with which it's moved. Um, so, not all companies are like that for sure. Um, it's true that Series A sizes have gone up significantly in the last, you know, several years. Um, I think driven in part by um, the fact that many investors are moving towards these company building models where yep. it makes more sense to put more capital to work to get the credit, if you will, for all of the work that you're putting into the company. Um, but I don't think every, you certainly don't need a $100 million Series A or or even a $50 million Series A to create a great company. Um, I think when you go significantly below, I'm going to make up a number, you know, 25 million, you know, you really, you start to limit your ability to maximize the potential of the technology that you have. Right. And you, 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 because you can't recruit as, as big of a team, you can't do as many things in parallel. Um, and I think there's a bit of a competitive dynamic as well, where nowadays, if you're not out there with a 50 million Series A, some people will look at that and go like, oh, you know, there must be something, you know, wrong. Yeah. Even right. if there's, you know, it, it's not necessarily connected to reality. It's just sort of perception. Um, you know, most of our companies end up doing, you know, depending if whether it's person led or syndicated, you know, the series A's are anywhere between 25 to 50 plus million. Um, so I think we're pretty well in line with the industry and it's just a reflection of those trends that, that I mentioned. Right. I mean, if we look at the future though, really, I mean, it makes it, it makes it much harder, I think, for, you know, companies that don't end up with kind of that level of, of round size, right? Because if you, if you aren't in the $50 million Series A club, let's say you raise a $5 million Series A, right? You're still going to need another good slug of capital get, to get through an IND and into the clinic. And if you have most of the leading funds that are, are focused on either creating their own companies or kind of simply pushing things into the, the larger buckets, I think it creates a pretty big gap for the kinds of companies that can get financed and the kinds of financing that will actually drive like real value creating events within within these smaller finance companies it makes it much much harder well i it may make it harder in the short term but i think it just creates opportunity for alternative models right mm -hmm. um you know for sure you know the versions of the world and you know or in our or in our peers are probably not going to be looking at companies that are seeking a $5 million Series A, right? right. Because generally speaking, we're investing in platform-based opportunities yeah. and you just can't do a lot with $5 million on a platform unless there's some very, very specific question that you're trying to de-risk, right? In which case, right. you know, you're doing seed financing. But I think, again, that just creates opportunity for other models where maybe a model like Bridge Bio, 
right? Where, where you know, you can do more project-based funding uh, is a way for those companies to advance. Um, or, you know, there, there are certainly other investors, angel investors, and, and maybe a bit smaller funds that would be attracted to that type of model. Um, and there are certainly groups that are, do asset-centric investing mm -hmm. versus the types of platform investing that we tend to do. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions and I'll, I'll take kind of, I'll take two of them in sequence. And the, and the first one is a little bit, uh, is a little standard, but what are, it, it says, what are the top features you look for to invest in a successful company? But, you know, if you could kind of pin it down, what are, what are the things that really spark your interest and separate one company from another that says, or, or a technology that says, this is where, this is where we need to go. This is what we need to do right now. We need to fund this. Yeah. Um, there's a few things. Uh, the number one criteria that we have is the technology or the program, it really needs to have the potential to change the game, right? We're really looking for big breakthrough innovation and not something incremental. And just to, you know, make a, an example, right? If, if it was, say, reformulating a drug to go from twice a day to once a day, you know, that's not something that we would probably get very excited about, although it could be a really good commercial opportunity. Yeah. It's just not going to truly change the game in terms of patient outcome, right? So we're really looking for those big kind of breakthrough innovations. They're typically platform-based. So that's that's the first criteria. Um, the second criteria is that, you know, we, we can really do something that others can't. So the differentiation aspect and what you'll see in this company on Thursday, and I, I hate to speak, you know, it's cloak and dagger here, but the company is really pioneering a white space, right? There is just no one who can do what these guys are setting out to do. And that's exactly the kind of opportunity that we like. Um, we may fail, uh, but um, if we succeed, you know, we'll be very successful because there's nobody else in that space for now, right? There will be others right. soon. Yeah. Um, the, the third thing I'd say is we really, people often ask, well, why, why are you so focused on platforms? And there's kind of two reasons for that. The first is, there's three reasons I would say. The first is that we can diversify our risk across multiple programs because we have a platform. Second is in constructing that portfolio, we can pursue programs that have very low biology risk. In other words, they're already validated targets, but we're coming at them in phase. And then also have programs that take more biology risk because we feel like biology is the hardest thing to de-risk. So we like to have a mix like that. And then the third thing is a platform enables you to partner um, and bring in non-dilutive cash. And that's just a great way yeah. to extend a company's runway without overly diluting uh, shareholders. Yeah. I also think as the, as the round sizes have gotten higher, it's gotten, uh, I think, it, it, it gives the company the ability to be a little bit more flexible and, and really kind of eases the ability to add partners, right? If you have your own capital that you can put into a, a program, then it gives you the ability to do different kinds of deal structures. And it's, it's much more enticing to uh, larger biopharma companies than, again, the, the $5 million platform where they may be one of the only people at the table. So there's a question that, you know, I don't, I don't love how it's phrased, but we're going to twist it around a little bit. It says, you know, what are you doing to remedy the local challenges in terms of, you know, lack of qualified middle management? You know, I understand not, not that it, not that it's your job, but said a different way, you know, what are some of the strategies that you think about for this? Because now you're getting to the point where you look at either, you know, you look at a blue rock or something like that. You're almost getting to the point where you can recycle some of these folks out of successful companies that you've already started. Yeah. Well, you, you, you nailed it. Like I, I think there's two ways I think that we can really grow this ecosystem, right. Addre specifically addressing the talent constraint, right. The first one is recycling folks who have been successful. And I get, you know, super excited when I see companies like prevail you know, exiting and people like Emily Minkow becoming available, right? Like that's that's what you really want to grow an ecosystem is, you know, someone like Emily has been there, done that, 
right? And I can't wait to see, you know, what she's going to do next, right? And hopefully she'll say. Does Emily need to submit a resume through the chat? Is she? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to look at the attorney. I don't, I don't think she needs to submit a resume. We all, we all know her. <laughs> she's being courted by lots of people. Let's just hope she lands in New York. <laughs> yeah. We hope so. We hope so. But, you know, as these companies, you know, exit, you know, to, in, in the VC parlance, meaning they go public or they get acquired, yeah. that, that's just a phenomenal opportunity. And, you know, we've been fortunate in New York that companies like Blue Rock and Black Diamond and Prevail um, and others, right, have exited and there is an opportunity to recycle the talent. So I, I think that's without a doubt, probably the best strategy for addressing the talent challenge, right, is, is, is continue to recycle and have a train the trainer model, you know, where, where those folks are then educating the next generation, right? And that's, that's how Boston bootstrapped itself up. Yeah. Um, and so that's one. The second one is, and this is where, you know, I don't have a good, good way to approach it, but I, I've always thought it's an opportunity, is there are a bunch of people commuting from New Jersey to Boston or even New Jersey to Philly yeah. who may prefer to stay local, right? And I've always thought I should just go to like Newark airport on a Monday morning <laughs> and hand out business cards. <laughs> I'm hoping maybe Newark bio or, or yeah. the city will, will do something to try and uh, entice these folks to stop commuting. So yeah. that, that's a second approach. I'll, we'll set up a satellite office in the, uh, in the Delta shuttle terminal at LaGuardia. I'll hand out coffee and you know, ask people why they're, they're waiting online. Yeah. yeah, that's not bad. It, I think, yeah, I don't think anybody really wants to hang out at LaGuardia and, and having done that, you know, commute at least a little bit, uh, I can attest to the fact that it's not very fun. So yeah, we'd love to keep people here like that. But it, and, and again, it's, it's hard, right? I think given the, I think over the last however long, it's gotten easier to do kind of the, the one day commute to, to Boston or, or whatever, and it's been kind of accepted. But now I'm, I'm really kind of hoping the pendulum swings back the other way where there's enough opportunities to say that, you know, you don't have to do that. You know, you can actually stay here. You don't have to, you don't have to fly back and forth. We can actually build something here. And the other thing that I'm seeing is that there are more, there are more companies that are now starting to, if they don't put the whole team here, they're at least putting pieces of the team here. And they are actually putting together, you know, folks within, within shared working spaces that, you know, constitute at least a piece of the team, whether it's something like, uh, you know, Nuvation or, you know, David Hong's group that they have people here, they may have folks at other places, but this distributed research model means that any part of your company can almost be anywhere. And yeah. like you said, there's a lot of people that genuinely want to be in New York. So I'm pretty hopeful that that can at least represent kind of one piece of the puzzle for things that we can do. It's a great point. And I would say that, you know, all of our current companies that are operating in New York have multiple sites, um, whether that's in Boston or San Diego or elsewhere, uh, Canada. Um, and that's another great way, I think, to train up, if you will, the local talent base because they're getting a lot of exposure, typically to folks who have more experience outside of uh, the New York ecosystem, you know, which is the reason for having the multiple site model is because you can't, it's hard to assemble all of the capabilities that you need locally. And so if you can split that to some extent, but have a lot of crosstalk, that's another great way, I think, to help bootstrap up the ecosystem. Yeah. So we have, uh, we've got a couple of questions on COVID that I think are, are useful. And one of them is just, you know, how do you think COVID has changed the biotech and diagnostic space? And the second one we get into, you know, video conferencing. Now that we're now that we're virtual, what is or we have been virtual for a year and we've actually tested this out, you know, what does that mean for the future? But I guess the first question is really more of a you know discovery and development question. So do you look at, at the way that companies have responded to COVID in terms of either accelerating programs or just how fast and efficiently everyone moved? Um, do you see that's open kind of new doors in terms of things that that you can do with more nimble capital or were you were you guys already that nimble i mean i think the the speed with which the biopharma ecosystem responded to covid is unprecedented and yeah. astounding like if you had asked me you know whatever it was back in march 2020 if we were going to have a vaccine by the, i i would have said you're crazy oh yeah um, 
So it took us <laughs> all, I mean, it was a, the most amazing thing to see. Uh, and I was really a spectator. I didn't really have a part. Uh, but it was just incredible to, to, for, to show what this, what this, you know, industry can do. Um, so it certainly got us thinking about, you know, could we be more aggressive? Could we do more? You know, can we be faster? Um, what is it that really enabled uh, these vaccines and some of these therapeutics to be developed so quickly? Um, so it's really an inspiration in that sense. Uh, and I hope that people don't lose sight of that, you know, as we go into, you know, all of the various discussions that are happening at the, the congressional level and so forth right now, because um, it would be a real shame. You know, in terms of how we operate as biotech companies, I think the other thing that we got out of COVID is, you know, clearly you can do a lot remotely. Um, and, and certainly we've been able to build teams and hire teams and do it entirely virtually through, through this process. I mean, I have a team that's coming together for a new co in Boston where I haven't met in, I haven't met in person with a single one of them. Yeah. So it's kind of crazy. Um, all of that said, you know, for again, a research-based biotech company, you need people on benches in labs and there's no way to virtualize that. So at the core, you, you need some kind of a physical place and a physical space um, to do that work. But a lot of the rest of the company can be, you know, phoning in for, for, for the lack of a better word. And so I think that the net benefit, you know, it, it does create opportunities uh, for, for places like New York, but also elsewhere, where you can access talent, you know, all over the country and all over the world. Um, and I think that really extends the, uh, extends the reach um, and enables you to maybe build companies that where you would have had to have a second site in the past, maybe you could do some of that virtually. Right. Do you think that, um, do you think that at, the, at some point, everyone needs to be together? consistently or do you think that long term you can have this bifurcated system to, to build and grow a company yeah i mean maybe i'm old school but i i do think that you miss something uh by not actually being in person um you know clearly we've managed pretty well uh through the last year and a half but i i do think something is lost um there's just nothing like the you know the so-called water cooler conversations to really get outside of the you know, day to day kind of thinking. And, um, you know, I think we missed that. Yep. Maybe it's my history taking hundreds of depositions over my career, <laughs> but I like to be in person <laughs> when I'm asking the questions. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You know, it's interesting. So we have a, uh, we have a back to work series coming up in, uh, in June over, over the next few weeks to talk about, you know, how companies are handling this, how real estate uh, real estate firms are handling this and really thinking about, you know, what does it mean to get back in the office? You know, when are we going to do it and how are we going to do it? So I, I think the the topic is real, right? And, and the main thing is when do you need to be in person and when is it not important? Um, I think I, I personally feel for certain things that it actually, you know, it, it hits a really high level of importance. Although, you know, I'll say that I was, I'm, I'm really surprised that at the efficiency and effectiveness of the virtual platforms like this. I really, I didn't think it was gonna be this good. Uh, and I didn't think it was gonna be really, you know, I didn't think we were gonna have the ability to be this productive. So um, I'm really interested to see what the blend looks like going forward. Um, yeah. This is a good question. So do you think that because of COVID, has this kind of you know, opened the door again for uh, antiviral, antibiotics, antifungals, um, you know, is, does it open the door to that, to that space or do, you know, do venture folks still look at it as a really challenging business opportunity? I wish the answer were yes. Um, but I think the actual answer is too early to tell. Yeah. Um, the fundamental, the fundamental issue with anti-infectives and I'll, I'll separate out antivirals. They're a little bit different. Yeah. It, it, is that the, the model of doctors keeping drugs on the shelf because they're rightly concerned about resistance right. is, is, is antithetical to a sort of util, you know, usage-based reimbursement model, right? So it's just fundamentally commercially unattractive um, if folks are deliberately trying to keep your drugs on the shelf. Right. And that, that, that has been the Achilles heel 
of the anti-infective space. And again, there's very good reasons for keeping those drugs on the shelf. So yeah. we need a different way uh, to commercialize you know, anti-infectives. The good news is that not just in the US, but elsewhere in the world, um, but also in the US, there are really important um, pieces of legislation and experiments happening with new commercial models, subscription-based models, for example, mm -hmm. um, where you know hospitals will pay like you know one price for a year to have access to the full armamentarium of antibiotics, whatever you get it. <clears throat> right. I think we need something like that to change the game uh, in terms of how these drugs are reimbursed. And until that happens, I don't think you're going to see a whole lot of enthusiasm for new anti-infectives, at least from venture investment. Yeah, no, it doesn't. It doesn't seem like the it doesn't seem like the commercial structure is there to support the kind of exits that you know venture really needs to to support their investments, right? And and it's unfortunate, but you look at some of the companies that you know have been formed over the last uh, few years. You know, Spiro comes to mind, who had a great team, developed you know developed really really you know a really good drug, and you know commercially the success hasn't been there. Um, you know, I, I think there are, again, I, I'm, I'm with you. I think there are new opportunities here. Um, I think, you know, Chandra Ghost has done a great job with, with BioHarmony, and I really want to see that company succeed. But it's one of those things where the commercial structure makes it very, very challenging for, you know, somebody to say early, you know, yes, we're going to bet on this because we think the outsized potential is there. Yeah. And, you know, Sp Spiro is a good example. I mean, they've done better than anyone. Right. right in the recent past, um, you know, I think their market cap's 400 plus, right? right? Enterprise value, I'm assuming, is 300 or so, um, and that's that's literally as good as it gets right now. That's the that's the that's the yeah. best example you can get like right. within the last within probably the last 10 years. It's the best example out there. Right, and um, and that's great. You know, it's good to have. I mean, that that's starting to become interesting, right? From a from an investment point of view. Um, but you compare that to, you know, uh, your, your plain vanilla precision company, which is worth multiples of that's probably still preclinical, right? <laughs> it's, it's Gra well, hard. look, Graphite Bio's Series A was was a year ago, and they just did, what was the value of them in their crossover round, right? So that's, yeah. I don't know what the math on that is, but it's more, you know? <laughs> <laughs> it's more uh, than that. We Go ahead, Jennifer. I was gonna say, we actually have a couple of questions about, you talked earlier about how Versant looks at platform companies, right? Or looks to develop a platform. So the question is, can you define what that means in Versant terms? And then do you look for platforms in a specific area or do they overlap depending on what you're finding for investment? Yeah, um, so platform for us means it's typically a technology that can be applied to develop multiple products. Um, so example, uh, Century Therapeutics is a company that um, I was involved in starting. It's based on an IPSC platform, induced pluripotent stem cells that can be differentiated, can be engineered and differentiated to create CAR T and CAR NK type products, right? So that's a, you can create literally hundreds of products from the Century platform. Uh, Graphite Bio is a next gen gene editing platform where instead of knocking genes out with CRISPR, we're knocking genes in. Um, and so it kind of opens up another kind of white space opportunity where you can really address diseases that are loss of function instead of gain of function. Uh, and you can create hundreds of products because you can knock a gene into anywhere in the genome, right? So that's what we mean by platform. Um, the, you, there was a second part to your question about therapy area. I missed that. Yeah, yeah. like do you, do you specifically focus on platforms only in a certain area or are they overlapping? Um, you know, we have many, many companies that work in oncology, many companies that work in autoimmune, many companies that work in rare disease. So there, there's a lot of overlap in that sense. We try not to have like head to head competition, um, but sometimes we do because companies, you know, at the time that we're building them or investing them, you know, they're not necessarily competing, but eventually those management teams make a decision and, you know, we're, we respect their decisions. Like we're not going to, stop them from competing with another one of our portfolio companies. Yeah. Um, we actually, and then Cindy Green had a, a question. This sort of goes back to the conversation we were having a few minutes ago on what are your thoughts on antifungals? The Pfizer acquisition of Amplex, I think I said that right, is exciting in her opinion. 
Yeah. No, look, a, a, any acquisition of an anti company is exciting. Um, I don't know the terms of that deal, so it's hard for me. I can't comment specifically on it. You know, but I think antifungals, you know, maybe there's a little bit less saturation from a from a number of therapeutics perspective in that space. I don't know enough about the resistance of antifungals to really comment intelligently, but I think it shares a lot of the same challenges as antibiotics do. Um, but I, I can't be more, uh, more more articulate than that. On, on that space in particular. Yeah, I think it's one of those things where when you have something like oncology that everyone is in, you have kind of the rising tide lifts all boats. And when you have smaller categories, you almost need to kind of make the market for it, right? So just in general, it's it's more it's more work to try and make the market, even though when you have good technologies, especially in something like antifungals, which were a huge, 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 huge problem uh, globally, it's you know it's a little harder when you have to think about when you have to think about the exit. So th this is a good you know this is a good segue here, right? So when you're when you're thinking about new areas, how much of how much of the discussion is about you know do we think there do we think there's an exit here? Do you genuinely think that in most places that the the market will follow the science? Um, I mean, you talked about investing in 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 white space, right? Does the white space from a technology perspective? need to be in an area where you can really just see any one of a number of kind of exit possibilities or you know do you feel reasonably confident uh or are you able to build confidence about say a, a white space project in perhaps a, a lesser developed um area so one example of this is so uh i was talking with julie grant over the weekend who did day one pharmaceuticals at canaan Right, and they're you know they're basically pioneering uh, therapeutics for uh, childhood cancers, which many larger pharma companies don't run trials in. Right, so how do you think about how do you think about white space uh, and exits when there are pieces of the puzzle that just aren't there? Yeah, so um, you know, to use the Wayne Gretzky expression, we're always trying to skate to where the puck is going to be. Um, but we're trying to anticipate. Uh, where pharma is going, and therefore where will public market sentiment be going? Mm -hmm. um, that's a big part of how we think about things. Um, you know, when we are, you know, considering an investment in its totality, that's one key criteria. Is you know, ultimately, if we do X, is there going to be a buyer, or or the public market is going to be receptive? And what are we going to need to show for that to be true? And that, that, that second part, the what do we need to show for that to be true is different in different therapy areas, right? In some areas, you know, you can run a phase one, two study and, you know, have a multi-billion dollar acquisition. In others, you need to run a phase three study will, before anybody will believe that you have anything, right? And, and yet others- Hello, cardiology. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. And then others, preclinically, right? Uh, people will- I into your thesis. So yeah. that is a big consider. Both of those are big considerations for us is, you know, is there going to be a buyer there at the end of the road or, or are the public markets going to be receptive? And what is the end of the road? How far do we need to take something before folks will buy into it? Yeah. So um, I know we, we only have a few minutes. Um, what, um, so we have a question from Anthony Johnson. What does the New York biotech space look like in 10 years from your perspective, Carlo? And, and will we fill the space? So we, we've talked about space has been solved or relatively solved, right? Within the, particularly within the city. Um, so what, is, what does biotech look like in 10 years here? Yeah, wow, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> I think the, the base case in my mind is that New York will see steady growth, but not probably not exponential growth. Uh, I think it's more linear. And it's gonna be driven by recycling of talent, right, from existing companies. And it will slowly, you know, it will slowly start to turn exponential, but I think that, that will be out in like the, you know, seven, eight, nine year time frame, as you know, because it takes a little while for, you know, you gotta train yeah. enough of the talent base, right? 
So, you know, what I'm hoping to see uh, over the next couple of years is that all of the folks, you know, who have been involved in, you know, Blue Rock and Black Diamond and Prevail and Calliope and Bolastra and all, all these companies, that they're successful and that they, they do their, their second company. Like that's what, yeah. that's the key thing that I'm looking for to really feel that New York's on the right track. And then when that happens, that's, that's when you start to get onto that more hockey stick growth. Um, so that's, I think that's the base case. I certainly hope that that's the base case. You know, what could accelerate that or, or really bring in the exponential phase is if you know, New York sort of gains enough critical mass that these folks commuting to Boston and elsewhere decide to stay here, right? Yeah. That they're willing to take the leap uh, and do something locally. That that would really change the game. Yeah, I think one of the things that's that's working in our favor is now that we have now that we have more kind of bricks and mortar real estate that's gone up. Um, it's not just kind of the company creators and capital that are looking to uh, put people here and bring people into the region. I think everybody and everybody in the real estate sector is actively trying to bring people together to fill those buildings. And, you know, it's a huge motivating factor. And, you know, hopefully one of the things that can also step in as an accelerant is if we can get other, other companies to move here. You know, I think, uh, I think Landos is a good example. Landos, you know, started here. Uh, went through eLab, you know, the the CEO actually had a lab in Virginia. Um, they set up shop, I think, down, you know, down, down the coast somewhere. And now they're basically looking to come back. So I think the more folks that can look at this region as a place to not only start, but to build and to grow and even for pieces here, I think that's something that can, that can build on, a, on that exponential. So yeah. uh, again, it's, it's nice to be, it's nice to be both bullish and realistic uh, on that, but you know, now that, you know, we have more options from a real estate standpoint, uh, again, we have more ways of bringing company and we have more ways of building uh, that level of critical mass. And I do think we've seen commitment from certainly from the city and the state to try and, you know, and interest companies to locate here with different incentives. Um, I think that has to continue um, for us yeah. to really create this flywheel of, of, of that middle level. Yeah, and, I, and I think we, we need to really hold up that success examples and success stories that we have. Yeah. Right? I, I don't think people realize, you know, that, you know, Prevail, you know, was kind of a New York born and bred company and yeah. Yeah. Black Diamond, you know, as well and Blue Rock and, you know, in applied, uh, applied therapeutics and, and uh, what is it, Neurogene and yeah. Lex, you know, right? all yeah. these companies like, I would really encourage you guys, like get those teams on this forum and have them tell their New York stories. Like I, I think it would be hugely inspirational and, and folks would see that it's actually possible. People are really doing it and doing it successfully. We'll have to repost uh, the Nancy Thornberry episode and the Anthony Johnson uh, episode and, uh, and, and Nolan Townsend and, and, and these folks. So we're, we're, we're super excited. And, and one of the things that's, you know, almost hard on our part is that there's so many great examples and, and Prevail is a really good one. It was, you know, Jonathan Silverstein basically accelerated that company from, you know, from nothing to, you know, to street public in, in almost no time. It's, it's really exciting, but, you know, it's, it's one of those things that we just kind of hope to build on as, as a region. And, you know, we couldn't be happier that, you know, you chose to come here, you know, however many years ago, because, you know, you're one of the first puzzle pieces in, in really kind of making some of this growth happen. And, you know, I think a lot of work gets put in early and then you kind of start to see a lot of the returns uh, afterwards. So we're just hoping to keep building on that. So listen, thanks so much for joining us today. This has been fantastic. Um, if you have any last words for the audience, we can give you the, uh, the final point here. <laughs> well, it's been great to uh, be a part of this and to be a part of the New York ecosystem and look forward to doing it for many years to come. And you know, I'm uh, I'm uh, not going anywhere. So, <clears throat> and look, look for our announcement on Thursday. <laughs> Sounds good. Thank you so Thanks much. Thanks so much, Carla. Uh, and we'll give you total credit if we decide to put up a billboard at Newark. <laughs> we will. We can. We will. Can we use your face and likeness with that? We can do that. This is your idea. So we're gonna we're gonna market you out. Sounds Thanks great. so much. Thanks, Hope everybody Carla. has a great Thanks, day. Guys. Thank you, Carla. Enjoy your day. 
Thank you for tuning in to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. Join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. for more discussions with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. For more information on New York Bio, please visit us at www.newyorkbio.org.